Hey, Matt. Hey, Paul. G'day, Aaron. Hey, uh, so uh, we've got another exciting uh, episode of Devs in the Shed lined up. Um, as you can see, we're joined here by uh, Andra Christie. He's a senior, senior solutions architect here at AWS. Uh, this is a, a probably an exciting topic, I think, for uh, many people. Today, we're going to get into Metaverse and uh, Digital Twin. So um, Andra is going to talk to us a little bit about what she's doing in Digital Twins. But um, before we jump into that, I'd be keen to, to get a bit of an insight from from you guys and anyone in the audience around uh, what do you think a digital twin is? I know there's a bit of uh, differing opinions on what what constitutes a digital twin. Um, so from from uh, before I give you my opinion, maybe I'll open it up to to you, Matt and Paul, and I'll tell you if I agree or not. I, I was going to pick on um, the background that Andre's got there. What what are those in the background? It looks pretty cool. Uh, a bunch of vinyl records. So. I thought it was more appropriate given that we're supposed to be in the shed. No, that that's well, really awesome. Yeah. I think that that's not just a bunch. That is a huge That's, collection, that's a lot of okay. records. It's an addiction and it's not mine, <laughs> but sure. <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool. Pretty awesome. um, so my, my opinion's a little bit uh, probably strong on this. Um, you know, like uh, Aaron and I have done like a bit of work in video games um, beforehand. And, you know, there's a difference between having a 3D model um, that represents something in real life. And um, you can set up like little labels to show, you know, what's what's happening um, with real life systems. You might set up like a little API that when you change something in real life, it's going to reflect virtually. Like I, I know a lot of people use that label um, as kind of like a digital twin. Um, my, mine's a bit more strict than that because uh, digital twins to me was always about simulating in itself. So, you know, you might have like a, um, a reservoir that's pumping through water somewhere, right? Like, and you might be able to emulate that in your virtual 3D environment, but you're also able to change like the water pressure um, on your, your, your virtual model, right? And you might be able to do like liquid um, simulation as well. Um, so if you change the viscosity of the liquid that's going through the, the reservoir and the pipes, like you'd have a different interaction. So I always had like the chaos engineering approach, like what we're trying to do is we're, we're testing things virtually before we go and try them in real life where we might actually damage equipment. Um, and I, I think that's what NVIDIA give us their answer. And I, I think that's the old school twin maker, um, you know, digital twin uh, type type view on it but I, I know that there's huge value in all the other things that digital twins offer businesses where you know they they can virtually see what's happening in the physical environment when they're away from it um yeah cool yeah interest in others cool. uh thoughts what do you I, think, mean, like, I have a, a less strict view of it and it would probably be because it's it's not my area of expertise my understanding of the digital twin is it's a, a a virtual or a digital representation of something that exists within the physical world um, and you know you can you can see what is happening um, in that virtual environment. So I guess like you might have something that's I don't know difficult to get to, difficult to be able to see what's happening in real time, or you're not, not able to get like real time footage or views of what's happening there. But you can represent that in a digital or virtual format, so you can sort of see what is happening to that I don't know thing that exists within you know the real world. Um, and then I guess on top of that, yeah, you can run the simulations on it. Yeah. Uh, before I throw it over to you, Andrew, on on sort of your perspective and and sort of what you've been doing in Digital Twin, uh, I guess what I'll say is I kind of straddle both uh, Matt and Paul's opinions in terms of coming from a distributed and embedded systems point of view. Um, to me, from an embedded systems point of view, a digital twin has always been a shadow of something in the real world. So we have a digital representation of a traffic light, or in Matt's example, we have you know the the, the reservoir that's got the pump that's re re, um, releasing water or pumping water. Um, but then also I agree in terms of uh, it's, it's a representation of what's happening in the real world, but also you can then manipulate that, make changes to it to see how it would affect the real life situation and then sort of revert back to what's what's actually happening in the real world. That's my experience only through uh, other organizations that I work with who, who do sort of embedded systems. But I'm very keen now, Andrew, to, to hand it over and, and uh, find out what is your perspective on, on Digital Twin? Sure. And um, obviously, there'll be no surprise that we've got an official definition at AWS. Um, and that's that, well, shockingly, um, Digital Twins are essentially virtual representations of physical objects or processes or people 
that really closely mimic the state and behaviour of the physical counterpart, but most importantly, they're built to solve specific business challenges. And, um, you know, I know that's a lot of words, but that's what we focus on, what it's trying to achieve. And people can get really caught up in, oh, I thought that a digital twin was that, you know, 3D immersive world or immersive dashboard or CAD modelling or what have you. But that's only part of the equation. The the real difference between all of those uh, sort of advanced visualisations or, um, you know, CAD modelling or um, anything else that you're kind of... Um, you know, almost trying to call that, um, is, is basically the regular updating and the two-way updating between the um, physical object and the digital representation and the type of control that you can have over it to influence its state and behaviour over time, the ability to, as you guys said, to simulate a specific outcome, to even go back in time. Um, and I think one of the a couple of important things to call out is um, if someone has a, you know, 3D representation or those dashboards or what have you, it doesn't necessarily mean that it can't turn into a digital twin. And in fact, a lot of customers start their digital twin journey or their digital twin building blocks with those types of visualizations and kind of evolve to the more advanced digital twins that you know, the rest of us are familiar with. Um, and I think the, la the last thing that I'll add to that is, um, you know, not to shoot myself in the foot, but not everything is going to be a use case for a digital twin. If you can achieve your objective with that immersive dashboard and all you want to do is predictive maintenance, it's totally fine. Um, they're also not uh, mutually exclusive because you might start out with a use case that's focused on you know, a subcomponent or a component, the engine, and then that grows into the entire car and then that grows into the entire assembly line. So, um, you know, you can't, you don't have to put yourself into a box and go, well, you know, this is where I am. I guess I'm going to stay here. So it, it's, it's really flexible that we've got all of these complementary technologies that kind of allow us to grow into whatever we're trying to achieve eventually. And as I said, you know, it doesn't all have to be digital twin. It might be all that I'm talking about at the moment, but um, it's not the be all and end all of it. So. so based on your definition, I didn't hear anything in that that said it has to be 3D. So mm -hmm. given that, you could, say, you could say that uh, based on your definition where it's representing, say, a, a system, um, yep. If we had a map and it could be a series of traffic lights and we're just representing the on and off state of traffic lights uh, in, a, in, the, in the pattern of you know, traffic flow, would that be considered a digital twin? Absolutely. You can start out that, you know, you can start out with a 2D digital twin. And as you rightly said, if you've got a map or a PDF of a floor plan or whatever it is, and you can still add anchors and tags to it to showcase what's happening and it's still kind of um, displays the, the right location of where those particular entities that you want to monitor are, you know, the world is your oyster. It does, you know, I am probably a bit partial and biased to the 3D element because let's face it, as humans, we interact with the 3D world on a daily basis and that's how we interpret and kind of digest things. So I think it um, makes a lot more sense to be able to digest and interpret operational data in the same way, rather than, oh my God, I've got 10,000 dashboards, but you know they're all screaming at me, but I can't really make sense of where something is. And actually, that's a really common thing that we've had to deal with um, in regards to you know, the lead up to releasing um, TwinMaker. Um, a lot of customers uh, were telling us that hey, yes, I can achieve, um, you know, my objective with the current implementation of solutions that I have, but I don't have that single pane of glass. Um, if my, you know, hypothetically uh, plant operators um, get an alert from the plant floor, we've got to, you know, waste potentially 20, 30 minutes figuring out where that thing actually is on the plant floor. And when you're talking about potentially thousands of pieces of equipment, and this is just a small example, um, you know, having that 3D view where that object is anchored exactly where it's located in the real world makes a huge difference. And especially also if you've got 
the various data feeds that you might start out with with just a I just want to see what it does. But then when you move on to that next, you know, third and fourth level, what we call living digital twin, where you can actively control it and kind of go, you know what, I want to change the water level. I don't need to send someone there because I can actively control those elements remotely. So, um, and again, a, a good segue to, to do a plug. Uh, if anyone's interested in the leveling guide that we've put together um, for digital twins, I'd recommend having a look at the AWS uh, blog and just do a like digital twin search, unlocking the value of, and it kind of, kind of goes through the um, levels that we've set up. So the levels are um, sort of similar to what you see in the um, autonomous cars world where, you know, level one, um, you know, is like a descriptive kind of thing all the way through to level five where it's like hands off, um, no need to, to do anything. It's all done for you, fully automated, controlled, etc. So we've, we've kind of done a, a similar thing um, in regards to digital twins. And I think it's a, it's a really good starting point because I feel like I'm talking too much, too many thoughts going on at the same Not time. No. Um, but one, uh, one other really important thing to mention is um, one of our customers, um, Woodside, who um, has been a customer for a long time and they actually built their digital twin on us before Twinmaker came out, um, they've got the ultimate goal type digital twin, if you, if you like. They're, using, um, they're even using robotics. They're using robots to, um, you know, uh, interact with knobs and turn them on and off and um, they're doing the 4D thing where they can go back in time. It's, it's a really, really cool implementation. But not everyone needs to go to that level of ultra-futuristic digital twin. They can have something a little bit more simpler or smaller. And actually, most of the conversations that I have with customers are around advising them that they don't actually need to start with that massive end goal in mind. They can start with a you know much smaller project or use case. They can prove it out. Um, they can demonstrate that to their stakeholders, show some ROI. And as we keep saying at AWS, keep building, keep iterating. And you know, very soon you'll end up with that style of digital twin if that's what you want. So is, and, would Andrew, you say you that said, the, oh, you go, Paul, you go, Paul. Yeah, uh, earlier you said that, um, that that was different to what Matt and I both said, like uh, it, it's a it's a digital or a virtual representation of a, of a thing, of an object, but you said people as well. Yep, yep. So um, there are a lot of, um, I nearly said inroads, but that's the wrong, uh, wrong word. Um, there's a lot of progress being made in healthcare around digital twins as well. So um, I, I, I sometimes use this as a good analogy for what a digital twin is, um, especially when people would say, oh, you know, why isn't my predictive use case where I'm already involving IoT and AIML uh, and I've got like a really cool updatable dashboard, why is that not a digital twin? And, you know, to a certain extent, it sort of can be, but that's just one part of the puzzle, right? Because if you take a human being and we've got, you know, the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, everything works in concert with each other. So rather than just having a digital twin of a subcomponent of my heart or my lung, if I were to have a digital twin of the entire person and how if I make a change to this system by taking a particular type of drug, and I'm impacting these other two systems because they don't like it, um, you start to understand the value of actually having that, you know, superior bird's eye view of that interconnected system rather than just one or two or three components. Um, so, yep. So I was just going to say, you know, in a way to, to turn that that model of a, of a human system into a digital twin, you'd, you'd need to be feeding in biometric data. Yeah. So your, your sensory of the, you know, your heart rate, pulse, your, um, you know, er everything, your, uh, you know, what's it called? The, your, your system, basically. Your, your, <laughs> yes. your system, <laughs> your, your system yeah. of systems. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking I, I'm the, seeing the like this like doctor's chart, in your, like, that's... you know, system shock and you've got all your upgrades and yeah. stuff like that. And you can so, see so like, yeah, or, 
<laughs> Deus Ex, you know, all, all of your subsystems yeah, exactly. running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but I mean, like I'm I'm thinking like your cardiovascular system, your neuron, your, your neural system, you know, like all of your different systems that make up the human body. Like you need to have active data. I guess that's is that what you're saying? Like the difference between the yep. the dashboard and the digital twin is the active data that's that's received from the real life the fact, counterpart. Exactly that that two way feed and the fact that it's updatable. So what you're getting when you get to that. And I don't mean living digital twin as in the human, but the um, concept of living digital twin is based on that, you know, when it updates itself and when it provides those um, predictions of what you should do, it's based on that particular entity at that point in time and what is best suited for it. That's where you can get to the point where, you know, um, you can uh, get out to producing hundreds of thousands of digital twins and they're each specific for whatever you're monitoring. Um, I, I guess that would be more relevant in like a um, autonomous car sort of scenario, but you get what I'm saying. Like every car, for example, is driven differently. It's going to have a different operational history. Um, you know, if someone were to do a digital twin of my car when I'm driving it compared to my husband, they would probably have a heart attack because I'm not a very good driver, well, but the digital twin would you know, be a way yeah. to differentiate. I'm, I, I'm just like throwing back to your your medical, you know, the, the digital twin of a, of a real life person. I think like I, I'm just thinking the benefits in the medical industry around, you know, like a pacemaker in the real life person, the monitoring system, understanding all of the systems and everything that's happening in that person. When they do go into cardiac arrest or something, then the actual uh digital twin being able to remotely execute uh you know a, a, a what do you call it when you you regulate the heartbeat again you know like so using the pace monitor monitor to regulate the heartbeat off of the digital twin like yeah. now interacting back back to the real world as opposed to just receiving data from the real world well yeah it also, I, I was gonna say like um rugby right like we had aws summit in 2018 or 19 and like we, we talked about like how we had rugby players that would have like, um, yep. you know, all this monitoring across them. And, you know, like you you'd look at the individual, rate. yeah, the individual performance of the athlete. And over time, you kind of learn that this is a standardized model of how, yeah, I don't know any, like Jonah Lomu, like let's go way old school rugby players, right? Like um, this is this is how he works, like end to end. This is, this is what happens. And, you know, like when he's injured himself, these are like generally what the stats show. Um, you know, you'll, you'll obviously see that he's injured himself on the field, but you could tell that he's actually like starting to, to put too much pressure on himself to perform. And so he might be like overexerting, like the way that he's using his legs, et cetera. Yeah. And, and the Fatigue coaches can and... see all this data in real time. And, you know, like that, that 2d surface that we talked about beforehand and they can go, Hey, go, go easy on like, um, you know, like, uh, making the runs of the ball. Like just just stay back a bit and try to do more catching or whatever. I'm not a sports person, but yeah. Oh, you you did really well. I was convinced, but then I'm also I'm also yeah. not a sports person, so maybe my opinion's not very valid. Like, yeah. oh, this guy really knows his sports. Wow. Yeah. The, the only rugby player I know. Is... Yeah, yep. that's all right because the only rugby player I know is John Lomu, so... and that's just because I played on PlayStation. Yeah. <laughs> so. I was going to say, uh, look, I think we're probably a bit far off the actual digital twin of a human and everything that it can achieve. In fact, um, with some of the discussions that I've had, um, you know, it, it could be something as, I'm not going to go to the as big as the genome project, but it's very, very intricate. Um, it's possible. And I think one of the reasons why it's more possible now than ever um, you know, talking to customers in the last year and a half about digital twins, um, there's so many companies who are focusing on digital transformation, no surprise to any of us, but they're also using more advanced technologies like, you know, graph databases. Um, there's a broader adoption of, of IT, um, of machine learning, of AI, and obviously AWS or cloud computing in general has made it not just possible, but within reach for any of our customers. It's not just like a faraway thing that only a large enterprise can look to achieve or to implement. It's it's kind of brought that a lot closer to, you know, within reach of, of, of pretty much anyone. Um, and, and that's really why, why we built um, we built TwinMaker. I like how I say we. I didn't build it, obviously, but <laughs> I 
I like to take some of the credit by um, including myself in that royal we. Um, but I actually think, um, and you know, I'll I'll show you guys a, a bit of the demo that I've put together and share some tips and hints. But I really think that uh, Twin Maker was designed, um, and this is just my opinion, so you know, not the official opinion, um, to kind of bridge the gap between customers who didn't want to start from scratch in building their digital twin, and customers who didn't want to invest a heap of development time in customizing an existing digital twin solution so it actually meets their needs. So, um, you know, I think it was very timely. Um, myself and my colleagues actually ran a digital twin roadshow last year before we even knew that Twin Maker was coming out. So it was really great to, um, you know, set some of those foundations with customers to find out more from them what they thought was a, di was a digital twin, um, you know, where they were at in that journey, what they wanted to achieve. Um, and hey, get the opportunity to talk to them again now that uh, uh, Twin Maker is on its way to GA. So you said the word demo, and I think that's something that our audience <laughs> would love to get Very into. Very keen to see. Um, yeah, let's, like, let's kick off with some of, some of the fancy, shiny things you're going to show us. All right. Um, let me do my fancy, shiny things of actually logging in again. Um, just a sec. I will be with you momentarily. So when we when we built the the IoT Christmas tree last year, in some ways that was a really, really like low level um, twin, Digital right? Twin. Yeah. You know, well, we had we... A, a virtual representation of something in the physical world. You could interact yeah. with that virtual representation, and it was reflected on on the real world. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we've created a digital twin. Woo! Yeah. I'll have to <laughs> well, set that just, all back up again so people can play with it. I was just going to say, like, uh, I I think I've been working with digital twins in the embedded systems world for years before it was called a digital twin. Because obviously in GIS, we'd, we'd develop, you know, again, that's what I know, map-based systems where you've got cars in the field. So you're tracking cars, but you've also got other, you know, di different things happening in the field. Like if it's a... Uh, an incident like a public safety incident you've got you know a shooter in the field and you've got police fire ambulance you know everything being tracked on the system as well as traffic flow as well as you know all of the different um, real life scenarios and then you're routing people around traffic and you're doing all sorts of different dispatching and the like to me that's that sounds like a, a digital twin because we're receiving data we're representing it digitally we're then interacting with that digital data and sending back out saying move here, go there, do this, you know, affect that. Um, yep. That's very cool. Yep. There's, uh, I don't think there needs to be uh, a massive barrier to entry where you start sort of gatekeeping and saying, no, you know, um, that's not a digital twin. Um, it, it can be, you know, as we were discussing before, as simple as that 2D representation, as long as you've got those updatable components, I think that makes a big difference. Uh, can you please share my screen, Paul? It's just popped up now. Cool. So uh, TwinMaker was um, announced last year at reInvent um, and it's still in preview. It's available in, in four different uh, regions, two in the US, uh, one in Europe and the closest one to us is Singapore. So what I'm going to show you today, um, I'll show you first the GitHub repo. Um, it's basically what we call the cookie factory demo. And um, it's something that you can actually deploy yourself in your AWS account. It takes you through the end-to-end -end deployment of a cookie factory. Um, it takes you through, um, and that there's, I should mention, uh, a few different components in um, TwinMaker. There's data connectors. So this is what allows you to connect to the various disparate data sources, um, you know, whether it's Sitewise or Snowflake or Time Series or S3 or whatever it is. And then um, you've also got the entity modeling component. And that's where you kind of build uh, basically a knowledge graph. Um, so you can add context to um, and meaning and semantics to um, basically your, your setup. So, you know, 
my main entity could be the cookie factory and we need the cookie factory I've got rooms and within rooms I've got equipment and then under equipment I've got you know mixes or whatever it is so um, the full setup of this cookie factory takes usually about an hour and a bit um, I've managed to take it down to about 30 minutes and if anyone's interested I can share my my tips and tricks with you because I've deployed it enough times to know what they are um, anyway the the finished product is um, so you go into twin maker in the console and the first thing that you'll encounter is um, and I'll do this in the context of the cookie factory so everything's already already deployed I don't need to deploy anything but um, you will have a workspace so uh, this is basically uh, an underneath the covers it's an s3 bucket and an execution role so we've got the cookie factory, but as you can see, I've got a whole bunch of um, workspaces there that are either deployed or in the process of being deployed. So the first thing that we'll have, um, you know, we'll have component types. Uh, you can have multiple component types. You can sort them by uh, predefined or user-defined. And this is how you, you, you connect to those data sources. Um, I'll just open up one of the user-defined and probably won't be a surprise, but under the covers, um, we're using Lambda functions to talk to uh, non-native data sources. So what makes this um, not native, if I have a look in this JSON document, if I can find it, is if you can see here, I've got the is native flag equals false. Um, and that's the case when we have to specify a Lambda, which is going to kind of provide the data for that particular component. There's also examples of components um, via these JSON documents in that GitHub directory as well, if you wanted to have a look and build out your own. And that's a good segue for me as well, because um, obviously we know there's a ton of data sources that customers want to connect to. So we've um, looked at providing like a really flexible framework so if you want to build a connector to another data source, you can have a look at the examples of the already built ones and kind of take an idea of, uh, you know, the level of, of effort that will be involved. So what are the native data sources? Um, so we've got connectors to SiteWise. Um, we've got connectors to S3. Um, we've got connectors to TimeStream. And we've also got a few external connectors to um, Snowflake. And I think we have almost a full connector, if I'm not lying, to um, OSI Pi Historian as well, and obviously more in the works. Any any uh, idea if WebSockets is on the in the works? I don't know uh, potentially, but yeah, I can I can take that away. Is I know they've got a lot of things on the roadmap because um, whenever we have a brand new product, everyone is immediately interested in their specific use case. So um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's, if it's there somewhere. Cool. So um, on, on to entities. So this is basically where you create the, the knowledge graph. Um, you can see there's you know, spaces, um, cameras, we've got equipment. And in this case, it's a large uh, number of mixes. Um, and if I scroll down, I'll pick my favorite mixer. Um, I can have different components associated with them. Uh, at the moment, I've just got a bunch of simulated data, but I can add another data source to associate with that particular component. If I've configured it and it can be, you know, like a site-wise um, connector, um, time stream telemetry, whatever it is. So I can add as many of the configured um, components to that particular entity as I want to. So, you know, if we've defined the component types, we're going to use them, we can map out the entity section, uh, I can add more components to that particular mixer, I can select the component as I showed you and, and just kind of configure it as needed. And then the third part of it is um, the resource library. So all of the files that you can see in here are what makes up the 3D scene that I'm going to show you shortly. So all of these GLB files, which are just the uh, binary format of GLTF, um, that's the format that we've decided upon. So these files were created in um, a different environment. Um, it could have been, you know, Blender or Unity or Unreal Engine. 
and then they were exported out um, after they were modified. Um, you know, obviously you can change them, you can strip them down, um, make them more streamlined. And um, most of these tools like Blender or Unity or Unreal have got uh, conversion uh, options so you can convert from whatever's the native format into something like GLTF or GLB. So these are basically the components that let us build out the scene. So there's the environment uh, GLB file, and then uh, we've got mixers, uh, cookie lines, and water tanks. And then um, we've got the actual scene. I'll get rid of the preview. So yes, we know it's in preview. Um, and it's just going to load up those files. Um, and it loads up that entity graph from earlier, so it's going to when it loads up, we'll see the building component of the 3D model. We'll see the cookie factory, the production lines, uh, the mixing room that we've modeled. Come on, do your download. OK, so um, you can also see these blue dots or tags. And that's um, you know what I'm essentially anchoring um, to a particular component. Um, and that maps back to the data source, and then I can set up rules. So let me take you into the scene. So we've got an, a number of different components that we can um, kind of play around with. So I'm using the panned camera angle to kind of zoom into the scene itself. This is my mixing room. And then if I change to orbit camera controls, I can sort of spin it around. Um, but there's a lot that I can do to sort of control my view. Um, I don't necessarily need to show you that it's a cookie factory, but I wanted to do it anyway. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll orbit it again. And I think in this one, I actually deleted the cookie lines for some reason. So I apologize for that. Anyway, um, so I can go into the particular environment itself. Um, if I select a particular component, it immediately highlights where it is. And I can also click on the particular tag. Now, if I wanted to associate um, a specific rule with this tag, I can do that. So if I go under the rules section, for example, I've got a few pre-configured rules. Um, and if I look at like the color one, um, you know, this one's really simple. If the temperature goes over 100, we want the tag to change to red. Um, and this is something that you'll see in the Grafana um, dashboard, which I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, so what I'm showing you here is basically you're building out the scene. Um, granted, the UI is not yet an end user UI. It's, it's intended for someone who's fairly uh, familiar with plotting a 3D interface, is able to zoom in, place data in the right location, and so on. So um, if I go back to the hierarchy, let me just pick one of the mixes. Uh, let me just zoom into the scene. Because it's in preview mode, it can be a little bit uh, fiddly sometimes. So usually when I click on a specific tag, it takes me directly to that um, location in the scene. It's just not playing along right now. So sorry about that, but that's OK. We'll, um, we'll still get to do what we need to do. Um, but if, if I go um, to this particular mixer, I can add. Um, Another tag, for example, um, I can specify where the data it comes from and complete the configuration. I can delete the tag. Um, I can also add um, lighting. So one of the things in regards to Scene Composer, which we're in right now, is um, we wanted people to be able to reuse their 3D um, models uh, and CAD files and uh, existing assets. So this is why the Composer interface doesn't have all the bells and whistles of a 3D editor because it's not meant to be a 3D editor. You're supposed to you know, upload your existing models, put them in the right place, add the tags, do all that kind of stuff, and go from there. So I think um, actually one of the things that um, I maybe didn't clarify is TwinMaker isn't a digital twin. It's a digital twin builder. So it's got those components that I've talked about that allow you to basically build out a digital twin. I um, mean like a digital twin maker? <laughs> uh, well, um, yes. 
Um, I, 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 I may have joked around with um, one of my colleagues who um, has twins, and I called him a twin maker as well. But <laughs> also I'm sure. sure, I'm not sure he he appreciated it quite so much. <laughs> this is very much like the editor view for uh, like Unreal or uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 Unity, yeah, yeah. yeah you can so, add, add objects, lights. It's cool. You you can maybe edit this out if I'm speaking out of uh, out of line. Um, I know we're, we're live, of course, so I'm, I'm making a joke, but we will uh, be having integrations and plugins with um, probably Unity um, to, to just make this process a lot easier. Because obviously we know if customers are creating these assets in a different tool, we want to make the export and import component much easier so they don't have to fiddle around. Like, yes, I've got the option here to actually, um, you know, I can move whatever object I want around, I can rotate it, I can scale it. But if I can export it and import it and it appears in the same location as it did in Unity, for example, then it's going to make things a lot easier. So that's just yeah. a super, super quick intro to this. Um, we've also got a really low level uh, no code plugin to Grafana. And I've got my, um, sorry, it's going to make me log in again. So if you want to, Stop me sharing for two seconds. Actually, it didn't log me out. We're good. Um, yeah, so if, if customers don't have the time or inclination to build out their um, end user digital twin application from scratch, they can take advantage of um, the, the low code Grafana uh, option as well. Um, and actually, this is the um, uh, continuous demo that's available on play.grafana.org. So this is also off the cookie factory. And the difference between what I showed you in the scene composer and this is this, it, this actually updates with those rules to show you what the live data feed will be like. So um, within that original scene, we had uh, a bunch of tags that were all blue, but within the real environment, which is uh, depicted here, um, and this should update shortly, um, we should have a bunch of, um, tags that are showing red as well because, um, you know, they've hit an alarm, um, they've hit a particular rule, and that piece of equipment actually needs to be um, interrogated. Sorry, it's, it's just taking a little while to load. So, um, and also you can do things like, um, you know, if you can see to the left, there's a camera view. Um, you can have, a, you know, a camera that has a uh, scene by relationship with a particular um, mixer or piece of equipment. So we can request either a live view or a previous time view. Um, you can select that based on time and date. So, you know, if something happened uh, like an hour ago, someone knocked something over, we can maybe uh, determine who it was. Uh, let me just see if I can change this to a time. Uh, here we go. It should load. So um, again, determine what went wrong at that particular point in time, and find the <laughs> the person to blame, so to speak. But you know, you can imagine in scenarios like this, we've got multiple factories, and the uh, the production effort is really important. And you know, any of these pieces of equipment failing or malfunctioning, like finding out the root cause piece, is actually really important. So. In this updated view, uh, let me just go to one of the mixes and show you. It's probably a bit laggy, but as you can see, there's a bunch of these mixes that are coming up with um, sort of the, the error tag. So obviously it's not what you want to see in your environment that everything is malfunctioning, but again, maybe it is because then you know that there's something wrong and you need to go you need to go there immediately and, and figure out what's going on. Um, there's less controls within the Grafana interface because you're obviously not modifying it directly. And there's also an option to uh, for, for managed Grafana, uh, Amazon managed Grafana, I should say, as well as self-managed. Um, I tend to kind of go, uh, recently I've been going for the managed Grafana because it's just much, much easier. Um, and you can also go into uh, the alarm history and have a look at, um, you know, you can see exactly when um, the behavior of this particular mixer changed from 
uh, normal to the alarm was triggered. Um, we can have a look at the RPMs or whatever um, modes of measure we've selected. And if we want to go in really close to see, um, you know, how granular um, that is as well, we've, we've got that option also. So, um, you know, building out these types of dashboards um, is, is actually really, really simple with Grafana if, as I said, there's, um, you know, no time or inclination to build sort of a, an end-to-end end-user um, end digital twin application, I should say. The, the other one that I quickly wanted to show you, and if you can do your magic trick of um, unsharing and sharing again, yep. I've got one. I don't think it's logged me out, but it might have, so just give me one sec. I've got one that I created of a... Um, water treatment plant and um, let me just go into the scene and log into Grafana okay and that one I can because um, I've I've got some simulated uh, data feeding into that right now so I can show you in a more meaningful way uh, a piece of equipment that requires um, some attention rather than all of them screaming at us with just those x's yes it did log me out come on so the cookie factory uh, example is just a really easy one that anyone can deploy in the AWS environment. And I think it's a really good way to get you started with what some of the capabilities of TwinMaker are without, you know, necessarily um, sweating it out too much. Okay, um, you can share uh, my screen again. If with can. the cookie factory demo, where, where is all the data or the sample data coming from? Like, so we can run the cookie factory, but then we can inject our data and like watch it's, machines change state and so forth. It's got a bunch of simulated data, um, yeah. and mm -hmm. most most of it is either um, site wise simulated data. There's a bunch of documents uh, from S3, um, and also um, if you wanted to go beyond the initial deployment of cookie factory there's um, a couple of advanced options whereby you can do some um, additional insights and analytics with um, machine learning so there's an integration with SageMaker and also with one of uh, our simulation partners uh, Maple Leaf or Maple so no I think it's MapleSoft sorry <laughs> sorry if anyone's watching and I um, yeah called it the wrong thing but um, it really gives you that, um, I think, end-to-end -end view of what you can achieve um, almost above, above and beyond uh, what you can do natively today with TwinMaker and kind of push it, um, you know, to that next level. So... I was going to ask, in your experience, like from, from a lead on from what Paul was saying around your data source, uh, like in my mind, site-wise would be the, the, the data source for an, an industrial application like this factory, you know, like a cookie factory or a machine shop or something like that. In your experience, is that generally the case? Are people generally pairing TwinMaker with uh, SiteWise? Look, not necessarily. Um, it is a really easy one because the connectors are already available and ready to go. But I think that's why we've kind of really uh, pushed that um, you know, custom connector framework um, in two ways. Firstly, you know, customers tell us what data sources you want us to focus on next. But if you don't want to wait for us, you can also build your own. So um, I think one of our launch customers um, is using SiteWise, Snowflake, and Pi Historian as their three main uh, data sources. Yep. But obviously, there's, you know, a, a ton more out there. If um if anyone from the service team for TwinMaker is listening, <laughs> then a, a a suggested addition would be integration with AppSync. Obviously, um a lot of the uh, sort of enterprise customers that we work with use AppSync to aggregate a lot of their different data sources. So if we have an aggregated data source through AppSync, then TwinMaker querying AppSync can get all the data in one place would make sense, which would be the equivalent of you know like SiteWise for IoT, but then AppSync for all of your yep. other data sources out there in the world absolutely um so if there's, um, a, there's a question here right that says um from young uh sslga 
Um, so could, could we associate, they said, can we associate employee GPS location with equipment coordinates and, and then I guess guess and we'll figure out who worked on what? Is that something that you could you could do as well? I think there's very little that you couldn't map out. Um, can we take that away and let me have a think about it? My initial instinct is yes. Um, there's a lot that we can do even right out of the box today that kind of fits a similar scenario. But um, I just want to check a couple of things so I'm not giving you a, um, a false answer in my um, desire to say yes. <laughs> Yeah, because even so, you'd probably be able to see, like, if something was down and then you saw that representation of that person and that person was in that location, you could deduce that that would happen and then you'd have to write some, some code later. Like, yeah, I mean, a human could deduce that if the machine's red and the, mach and the machine later is green and a person was close, that they fixed it. But then you'd have to, like, do some additional code over the top of that. Well, right? You'd also that's, have to have a device yeah. in the employee as well, right? Like, that's, correct. Right. that's right. Yeah. That's, that's right. Yep, yep. Uh, and and I think it's something that um, we're kind of moving into in um, if you think about sort of digital shipyards and um, and not even that but also um, you know sp specific um, locations that have got um, dangerous materials. So it's you know the example that you gave is is really relevant to that, right? Um, is anyone that has some kind of wearable device who's in close proximity? you know, can we um, set up an alert to warn them that whatever piece of equipment they're near is about to have a malfunction or whatever the case might I'm, be? I'm, I'm more even thinking, like, it may not even be a person, but, like, logistics and warehousing, right? A lot of the Amazon warehouses now are robotic. So mm -hmm. you want to know where the robots are, the pickers are, you know, coming from the crate to bring them to the different, you know, handover. Um, yeah. Where are those robots on the floor? So they will they will absolutely have a location in the factory or in the in the warehouse that they are. So it would make sense to then have it mapped in your digital twin. I, yeah. I also I also think like sometimes it might not be a digital twin fit as well. Like it might be it might be using machine learning GIS. like your your video data right like as well the GIS as well. Um, you know like what what happened and why why did we see these stats change? Let's let's have a look through the videotapes and well that yeah. That, that right. uh, g the GPS one immediately throws me back to the, the com you know, computer aided dispatching system. So like looking at where all the police vehicles are, where all the fire vehicles are, you know, it's, it's basically all of these vehicles have a, a, a GPS device in them. So you know where they are, but then you don't need to map it in the 3D <coughs> world. You just need to map it on a map. So you know where they are, you know, geographically. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So just quickly, um, before I jump out of the demo, um, I, I kind of cheated and overlaid some cookie factory stuff onto a like water treatment plant just to have a, a different view. And it helped that uh, some components of a water treatment plant, um, you know, include things like, ta-da, alum mixes. And oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so don't say that I'm not creative. Anyway, the thing that I wanted to point you towards was I've got a massive water tank, which would be nowhere near this big in real life. And I've configured uh, a particular rule to trigger. And now if I go to my end user application, being Grafana, and I have a look at my scene, which is hopefully updated. Uh, hey, everyone, done we're the... pivoting from a water factory to, uh, to making cookies. <laughs> it's nice. You don't think people make cookies in a water factory? Come on. What a, what a treatment plant. Remember, we're talking about sewage here, so not Oh, really. you're right, actually. Okay, <laughs> I, take, I take it back. I, I not went the kind of far. cookies you want to eat. Oh! <laughs> oh, actually, it didn't update, sorry. So what we were meant to see, which of course worked literally an hour ago when I tested it, was um, my rule kicked in with the updated data and the water tank was flashing a bright red. So apologies for my letdown of this. But um, anyway, in the real world, you can imagine that it's really handy to see a, um, and, and obviously you can, you know, choose what the depiction will be um, when you're getting your, um, um, you know, when the alarm is triggered and, you know, when you're sending someone to actually interrogate what went wrong. 
Um, so I've, I've got a few of these and uh, of course I'm, I'm kind of annoyed that this one didn't work. I'll, I'll just refresh it and see if it shows me what I want to see. And if it doesn't, I'll, I'll give up and I'll, I'll try it next time. Um, but look, I, I really hope that it's given everyone who's watching um, just an idea of what you can do, that it's a relatively low level, level effort, especially if you've already got models. And the other thing I'll say on the um, visual depiction on model side, there are so many sites with um, free 3D models that are available for almost any industry that you can leverage. Uh, no one needs to start building anything from scratch. So, um, and there's, yeah, sorry, didn't update. I'll stop sharing now. Um, yeah, so I've, whenever I've wanted to create a, um, you know, a, a new demo for a particular customer in, um, you know, whatever industry, uh, I usually go to some of these sites and most of the time I can find a pretty decent fidelity model that I can download. And then there's about three or four sites um, that allow you to do the conversion of those files online from whatever format it is to GLB. And, um, you know, the only caveat is they usually have to be about less than 100 meg, which is totally acceptable. And actually, the other thing that I get asked a lot, um, it's come up on almost every customer discussion that I've had is, you know, okay, it's great that you let me import my own models. Um, will I lose any fidelity? Because I've got these really high fidelity CAD files or BIM models or, you know, and so far the answer has been no. Um, if anyone experiences, you know, that loss of fidelity or has any issues, please let us know. But um, everything that I've seen, whether it's local customers or obviously talking to the service team and our overseas colleagues has seemed to indicate that it does a pretty decent job when converting to GLB. Um, the only uh, thing that I've noticed is take advantage of what's available to you in the scene composer and add lights. Sometimes when you import a model, it just shows up as like a completely in the dark, you know, black model. So add lights and magically you can see everything and you can spin it around and you'd be the so, god so, of your um, own twin. Could, what, one of the things <laughs> sorry, go for <laughs> well, one of the things I thought about was like um, you know, as as you know, usual developers, apart from Matt, who's like, you know, quite graphical, um, building a scene seems would be like hard. So so uh, so you built that specific water overlay scene you, you you went found all those objects and built it all up yourself what what tool did you use to do that and to build it so i actually found a 3d model on one of these sites and yep. i downloaded it um and and here's the thing because you have to sort of know your way around it you've got different options you can download a model like that where it looks completely 3d but all of those entities that you've got in the scene are essentially static. Or you can import that model that you downloaded into a tool like Unity and export that scene with the each entity as its own entity, for lack of a better description. And that's it's when you can, yeah, that's what I meant. Sorry. Um, I've been talking for too long and I'm, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if you want it, to do a quick demo like me, you might forego that. And, you know, here's where I'm showing my, my trade secrets, right? I only mapped three actual entities in that scene, but most of the things that you saw looked pretty 3D. Hey, I can okay. zoom in really close. I can spin it around. I can do lots of things. But what I didn't do was uh, export them as individual entities. And that's what okay. actually allows you to map them back to a specific data source to add the tagging and anchoring and, you know, so on. So, yeah. so, so I guess so what I'm hearing you say is that as somebody that hasn't used like Blender or 3D tools, like within like an hour or two hours, I could probably build a scene like what you have there in a proof of concept totally. environment. Absolutely. If And I think, um, you know, we've been discussing a lot about the visual aspect. 
of course, it's not the be all and end all. The be all and end all is the objective that you're trying to achieve. However, let's not forget that aesthetics and the visual aspect is really important to us as humans. We respond to it. So if you can present something in a way that's really easy to understand and digest for a human being, you'll probably have more success in getting your point across. So I mean, I, yeah, I think technically a... you could have just CSV files, right? And that would just be not, <laughs> not pleasant. Sorry, Aaron. No, that's, that's <laughs> fine. I think that you, you raise a really good point. Like the be all and end all is your objective that you're trying to achieve. Like I think in all this, the important thing to remember here is that um, twin maker is the twin maker. But in your experience, like if you're with the customer's objective, you know, the twin maker is the tool to get to that objective. Where are your customers uh, utilizing this? Like what, what are they actually, like I, I assume you use Grafana because that's some of what your customers are doing, but what's the end result of some of these digital twins that the customers are using? So um, a lot of the use cases that uh, we've seen, and this kind of stemmed also from the majority of the discussions that the Twin Maker service team had, um, were around basically improving operations. So if you think about improving operations in um, a factory setting, plant setting, um, doing remote monitoring, that one comes up a lot. And I think I've mentioned that. Um, one of our launch customers in Vista utilizes uh, TwinMaker and they've built their own end user application called the Connected Worker. Um, anyone who's interested can have a look at the public case study. It's quite detailed. Um, and one of their main objectives was we really hate um, having our plant uh, operators and uh, engineers constantly running to the plant floor to determine where this faulty piece of equipment is. We want to be able to, um, you know, have that preventative maintenance capability and also if something goes wrong, know exactly where to send someone, which, you know, enables faster decision making, saves time, et cetera. And then the third one, so we're talking, um, you know, uh, Smart city use cases, we're talking commercial buildings, we're talking power and utilities, energy. It's not an extensive list, but a lot of the use cases that we've seen do tend to tend to come from those um, particular sectors and industries. Um, and the, the third one was the uh, commercial buildings. So, you know, increase the um, occupational health and safety of tenants, reduce energy, uh, improve sustainability, um, and if you think about it in those terms, a lot of what I've mentioned there can easily be applied to any other physical space, not to mention add on top of it whatever your other use cases are, like that remote monitoring. Um, you know, let's go to the uh, what if uh, utopia and simulate what we want to do or what's going to happen in three months or, you know. So, so I... I'd like to like highlight young S Young's IGA like the question, um, can we use it for machine maintenance? You know, like to me, like from what, what you're saying, like that's that's basically what you're saying. But in terms of like predictive maintenance, you would sort of pair it together, your digital twin as a representation of yep. what the real world is. But then also you may have other applications like your object recognition or your other sensory to understand, you know, depending on what the monotron. machine is. Yeah, monotron, yep. exactly. Uh, yep. And then twin them together, or sorry, I should say pair them together with your digital twin. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, and obviously, we're going to keep working on the capabilities of what TwinMaker provides today as a managed service. But for anything that it doesn't provide right now, because it's not even GA, it's still in preview, um, there's zero reason why you can't pair it with other services to achieve that additional AI ML simulation type functionality. And on, on that note, you know, apart from our native services, we've got um, a big list of launch partners that provide, you know, visualization, simulation, um, insights capabilities that are really worth checking out. And some of them, as I think I mentioned earlier, are actually part of that uh, more advanced cookie factory demo, if anyone's interested in, you know, and more deployment. <laughs> So uh, as a gamer, um, if I was interested in building my model and then having, you know, having a, a virtual environment where I use my headset to walk around in, what you're saying is there are uh, launch partners who will actually be able to help me do that? 
I think so. So obviously Twinmaker itself has got a 3D component, but it doesn't yet have an AR VR component. Yeah. But I don't see why you couldn't do that with one of our partners. I'd have to double check, but it's I, I do know that it's something we ourselves have got on the list because uh, it's it's something that comes up a lot. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm sure one of our partners already provides that capability. Yeah, so like that that to tie it back to the very start would be the the, the boundary between digital twin and metaverse is that VR simulation side. So now your digital twin becomes an environment that you can walk through. Yeah, uh, just gives me uh, old memories of Second Life and, and Cybertown, and <laughs> need to update my VR equipment. <laughs> Uh, we've got one one last question here. Um, can Twin Maker be used for buildings? I think you you pretty much answered this in everything sort of that you were saying. But so um, if you wanted to have a look, um, I actually had this ready to go, but I didn't end up showing it. Um, I'll put it in the chat if you guys want to share it with the audience. Here's a blog I prepared earlier, um, <laughs> which is exactly based on. Um, the a digital twin of a building this is with another one of our par partners cognizant and it goes into minute detail of how they achieved it it's got um an architectural diagram uh, it's got everything you could want and more awesome they've paired um, it with their existing um end user application thank you so much for that um i can see we're we're coming up on time now so i'll just um i'll if there's no more questions, I'm going to wrap it up there and just say thank you so much, Andra, for coming on and sharing with us your demo on Digital Twin Maker and uh, stepping us through, you know, what the the official AWS definition of what a digital twin is, which is great to clear things up. So thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Andra. Thanks, everyone. And, um, thanks, Andra. Yeah, thanks, thanks for all, all the we'll see you questions. Same time next week. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye.